Hi, good morning, uh, and welcome to our the first in our webinar series, Security for Manufacturers, uh, SME edition. Thank you for taking the time this morning. So let's get uh, straight into it. Uh, so firstly, thank you very much for spending the time with me this morning. Uh, we're all really busy, and I appreciate you've got lots of things going on uh, with everything that's going on in the world at the moment. So thank you for taking the time out to be with me um, for this hour. We spent some time putting this together to ensure that you get the most out of this session as possible. Uh, and if you feel there's something you would like to know that I haven't included, then please uh, ask questions uh, whenever, you need, uh, whenever you need to. Housekeeping wise, um, we're all new to these video calls now. So if you could keep your um, microphone on mute for me and then uh, video camera on and off, uh, however you feel fit, however you feel fit. And then questions, as and when they arrive, please um, put your hand up or shout or save the questions at the end. Uh, that's absolutely fine. Uh, so who are we? Um, Equilibrium Risk is a security management company um, that specializes uh, in creating a secure environment for a manufacturer uh, to operate and grow. Um, our mission has always been and is, it still is, is to support manufacturing growth through effective and balanced security. Um, security is something all businesses, particularly manufacturers, need. Um, security, um, sorry, criminal crime um, is a part of uh, being hu being human, unfortunately. Um, but that said, if you put too much security in place, uh, too many barriers, uh, the business becomes ineffective, restricting its ability to grow. Uh, on the flip side of that, uh, if you don't put enough security barriers in place, don't use security enough, well enough, more effectively enough, then the victim, uh, then the company manufacturer will fall victim to criminal activity. So achieving that right balance of efficient, cost-effective security, uh, allowing a, a manufacturer to operate and grow is where we as a business excel. So let's first start um, with the fundamentals of security. And there's a key focus here on uh, the fundamentals for um, an SME uh, manufacturer. And there's three processes uh, that we look at to formulate um, a security plan. Uh, the first is assess. Um, so what are we protecting? Uh, and what are we uh, protecting against? Uh, then the mitigation stage. So what can we do about the issues? Uh, what are our options? Um, and lastly, the manage. Uh, what do we do when things go wrong, if things go wrong? And that's a three-stage so three cyclical process, um, and it's continuous. So let's look at the first stage, uh, the assessing uh, of your security risks. And it's important to note that it's, it's assets in the business uh, that draw the risk. Um, and they may be tangible assets, things you can touch, things you can see, or intangible assets. So it's the things in your business that you use to deliver your end product. Um, and they're broadly broken down into three distinct groups. Um, there's physical assets, so things we can touch, things we can see, so machinery, uh, buildings, uh, that sort of stuff. There's cyber assets, so maybe things we can't necessarily see that are connected uh, via the internet. And lastly, there's the personal assets, so it's the people within the business that deliver um, that product, uh, that process. What's unique about the manufacturing organization is that the physical assets and the cyber assets are actually conjoined uh, quite considerably. So if you consider um, a CNC machine, for example, um, it exists in physical space. You can see it, you can touch it, uh, you can take a sledgehammer, sledgehammer to it and break it. Um, 
but also it's on a network. It sits on a network that is and it's controlled uh, by logical controls, and you can easily destroy it or take it offline um, using a cyber attack. So if you're going to look at protecting that asset, you've got to look at the physical asset and the cyber asset and protect it as a whole. Uh, next, we need to look at what are the threats? What are the bad things that could happen to our assets uh, that's going to affect our production time, that's going to affect the bottom line ultimately? Um, and it can be quite a daunting prospect to think about all the threats that could happen. Um, but we simplify that process, make it a lot easier to group those threats. Um, so we can address them all um, quite simply. Uh, and we group them into four distinct groups. Insider threats. So people within your business that can have an adverse effect on your productivity. Um, and it may be a disgruntled employee, for example, or it may be an untrained um, member of staff. Uh, they will all sit within the insider threats. The outsider threats speaks for itself, really, people that aren't directly involved in your business that can have an adverse effect or do something to affect, to affect the business. Um, there is a slight crossover in the sense that you can have uh, an insider who is in a relationship with someone outside the business, but then they, they, um, they work together to, for nefarious reasons. Um, that's a slight um, crossover. Uh, the other type of threats are accidental threats. So people that do things accidentally that affect um, uh, your productivity, for, for example, spilling a cup of coffee on, on a computer system, for example. Um, and then lastly, there's malicious things that are done with a malicious intent to uh, gain the asset or gain some, gain some money. It's also worth considering um, what type of threats we are protecting against. Um, and it's down to the CIA triangle, which is well known. So the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of those, uh, those assets. Um, with confidentiality, it's important to remember that um, the, first, um, the first breach of security is where an asset is known to exist. So the rule, the need to know rule applies here. If a person doesn't need to know that this asset exists, then um, it should be kept out of the way. Uh, and it sort of rolls on with things like sort of IP um, and other uh, sort of proprietary uh, information. Um, the integrity, so is the asset um, able to do its job, do what it's supposed to do in the process? Um, and then uh, availability. Are the assets available to work, um, to do their job? For example, um, uh, raw materials, do we have the right raw materials that, that for us to deliver our solution? Um, uh, that sort of stuff. And next we'll, we'll move on to the mitigation. So what we can do, what we, what we should do to uh, mitigate those risks and there's two, two distinct um, methods of mitigating um, effects that I want to cover. Um, the first being the direct method of mitigation. And this is where most SMEs like to, like to put their money or like to look at for uh, mitigating uh, issues. Um, and we generally look at breaking it down into five distinct layers or five distinct steps. Um, deter uh, things from going wrong. Um, protect against these things from going wrong. For example, um, uh, asset hardening. If you look at the, your um, building within your organization, uh, you might have strong locks uh, on your windows and doors, for example. Uh, then you've got the detect layer um, that will detect and notify when things go wrong or when things uh, aren't 
quite what they should be. Uh, the respond layer, where you're responding to an event occurring, um, you identify and evaluate and assess uh, what's being detected and then um, dictate or respond in the appropriate manner. And then lastly, the recover section. So get the business back to normal work and operations as uh, soon and as efficiently as possible. What's important to, um, to mention is these, this layer, these deter, protect, detect, respond and recover layer needs to be for all the assets that uh, you've identified in your assess, your assess layer to look at how you can protect that asset against the, the identified threats. Um, it's much more cost effective to have these layers in place um, than investing a lot of money in, say, just protection or let's spend a lot of money in deterrence and ignore um, the other the other layers uh, by having uh, multiple layers in place uh, it's a much more cost effective way of protecting um, uh, those assets the other the other method of mitigation i wanted to um, talk about and highlight is the indirect uh, method of mitigation so stuff that you can do that's not necessarily has an impact, but um, an indirect way of protecting it. And it's something that is often overlooked um, for manufacturers, SME manufacturers in, partic in particular, um, for, for a lot of, lot of reasons. Um, the, first, the first area sort of assets, we mentioned that it's assets that, that draw the risk. So, we, so the first method before we start investing money in mitigating and investing security systems and gates and barriers and IT security solutions and stuff, we well can look at the, um, the assets themselves. I mean, um, can we remove that asset from, from the operation, from the process? is that asset does that asset need to be there is there a way we can deliver our product deliver our solution without using that asset um, that's the first or what's one of the considerations to make can we can we move it can we move it to a more secure location for example if we have if we have vehicles that we use to transport our product from point a to point, point b um, is there a way when we're not using them there they're secured in a more secure area inside the inside the building rather than the um, uh, parking area, for example, can we move that asset to somewhere that's it's a bit more it's a bit of a bit of a safer location? Can we substitute that asset? Something that's used particularly in um, museums or high value assets, um, they will substitute, for example, the Mona Lisa for a um, a replica. Um, so to keep the the real one safe and the replica is on, is on display is the way we can substitute in your manufacturing organization substitute that asset that might be high value um, for one that's not high value that's still going to um, uh, keep the business operating um, hide can we hide the asset can we keep it out of sight is there a way we can move it so no one's aware of the asset do we have a way of of keeping it behind closed doors so no one knows uh, that it's there. Going back to the going back to the statement that the first security breach is when an asset is known to exist. Can we hide the asset so it's so it's not seen um, and then becomes an attractive target? And then duplicate. Can we keep a spare in place um, in case it does get stolen? Um, we've talked about on manufacturing now. We've talked about the hidden factory. Um, can we sort of duplicate the asset to? Um, upscale if we if we need to or if we lose it to uh, produce the uh, the type of output we need uh, to keep the to keep the business running. Um, as well as as well as assets, um, there's the activity. So the the business activity uh, that can draw um, risk. So what is the process that delivers that product 
that um, whatever it may be, um, and within that activity that draws that risk. Is there a way we can stop that activity? Does that activity need to operate all the time? Can we reduce it to daylight hours or can we, or can we change it to um, nighttime, nighttime hours, for example? What is the activity and how does it, how does it operate? Is there a way we can change it? Um, for, it for example, um, I'm covering change and stop at the same time there, but you get the point. Uh, for example, if, if we've got, if we've got a, um, a risk of uh, vehicles being stolen, our dispatch vehicles being stolen, is there a way we can change the activity of issuing keys to drivers, for example, that's going to make that, that activity um, a more secure activity and reduce the risk of vehicles uh, being stolen? How about raising the awareness around the activity so that the people involved in the activity um, are aware of what the risks are? So education, for example, um, it's it's um, it's quite big within sort of cyber uh, cyber security, sort of um, security awareness training for people where they have um, phishing attacks um, or simulated phishing attacks, and see what see what they were raise that awareness and practice it. Is there a way we can raise the awareness of the staff so they are know that they're aware of these potential issues um, and look to uh, prevent them themselves? And lastly, redundancy. Can we incorporate a level of redundancy in an activity? Um, for example, do we have a spare, uh, do we have a backup internet connection, for example, should, should the uh, system go down? Do we have a spare vehicle that we can call upon uh, for this back? Do we have a spare machine that we can, we can use? Um, so what is the backup or what, can we, what sort of redundancy can we have in, the, in place to, to prevent or mitigate the the impacts of of a risk. So moving on then to uh, the management side of things. So what should you do when things go wrong, or what can you do um, when things go wrong, or if things go wrong? Uh, let's be let's be optimistic. Um, but the point thing is 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 to have a plan. Um, and if things go wrong, the first thing to do is to stop the effects, stop the, the bad impact of what's happening um, uh, and stop the adverse effects on your business. Great. And then um, try and get back to normal as quickly as possible. So on whatever normal is, and go back to um, the mitigation, the redundancy, or um, the replication of, of assets or um, service lines, uh, try and get the business back to normal as, as quickly as possible. Uh, and then review, review, see what's, see what's happened, see what went wrong, why did it go wrong? Is it, is what happened with intolerances? So we know that, we know, um, we know from our assessment that things could go wrong. Some things we'll decide that we need to do some things about, some things we've decided we're not gonna do things about um, because it's gonna to be too expensive to reduce that risk or mitigate that risk. In that, in that sense, some things will go wrong and it's within, within tolerances to, um, for, it, for it to happen. And we're quite happy because uh, to reduce that would, would be unpractical and unrealistic from a business point of view. Um, so we'd, We'd have a look and see whether it, whether or not it's uh, worthwhile doing something about. And then, lastly, prosecute something. Um, uh, one layer of, of security we didn't talk about was sort of the um, the, the prosecution to, to prosecute the, the wrongdoers. I and mean, it's always a bone of contention. What does a business do um, if things go wrong, uh, malicious activity or even accidental um, activity? Does the business pr prosecute? Um, by not prosecuting, um, you send out a signal where an employee internally or externally um, feels okay to, to wrongdo, um, but at the same time, uh, prosecution can leave a bad uh, security culture, or leave a bad culture, bad environment within the business. So if it's finding that right balance um, in the business, what to do when, when things uh, do go wrong. So nice, nice, short, quick. So to, to summarize then, um, manufacturers have unique challenges um, in, in what they do. Uh, they have 
the cyber element and their physical element are, are conjoined. So when we're looking at mitigating risk, we've got to consider the whole package of physical and cyber solutions to in, in, to deliver and improve that, um, mitigate those risks. SMEs, businesses need to look beyond just direct methods of um, mitigation. So look beyond just preventing the incident from occurring and look at sort of the indirect methods that um, prevent the event, prevent the offender um, from doing things wrong. Uh, and if they can do that, if they can do that, then there's, uh, they can save enormous sums of money um, from mitigating. Generally, they're happier workplaces and they're more productive business, business enterprises and they have more stable work workforces if they go beyond just direct methods of mitigation. And then lastly, we need to plan for things go wrong um, because generally it might not always happen, but it, it can happen and then there needs to be a way of planning for things go wrong and a continuous cycle of assessing assessing what's on the horizon, what's what's around that will, that may impact may impact the business.